from the EXL Digital Studio, this is Smart Conversations with Nalan Maglani. Welcome everyone to another edition of Smart Conversations. We bring you this edition from New York on a beautiful October morning. And today we'll talk about big data, algorithms, and high compute power, and how together these combine to produce the magical lives we live these days in the digital world. Joining me in this conversation are people who do some very interesting and smart work here at EXL. On my right is Mira. Mira is part of our analytics solutions team. On my left, Solmas. Solmas is part of our analytics products team. And Nagendra, who we bring in from our last conversations because he did so well that time, we have Nagendra here and he is the head of our analytics products team. So between Nagendra, Solmas and Mira, we'll try to figure out big data algorithms and high compute power for you today. Let me start with you, Mira. Okay. Big data. When you think of big data, what comes to your mind? How do you visualize it? So let me ask you a question. Do you have a smartphone? More like the smartphone has me. But yes, I do. Who doesn't? Exactly. Who doesn't? Yeah. And what have you done on your smartphone in the past hour? <laughs> Funny you ask me that. Because in the past hour, I thought you'd be late for this recording. So I sent you a text. And the four of us took a selfie. OK, so those two things you did are leaving a digital trace. Now imagine what billions of people are doing on their phones every minute, um, taking pictures, posting things, buying things online. All of those are data points leaving digital traces. And ultimately, all of that is big data. So all of this, billions of people taking billions of pictures, writing billions of things in billions of hours, all of this is being captured. Correct. Digits, bytes, everything. Yeah. Captured, kept. kept. Wow. How do you make meaning out of all this captured data, Solmas? Uh, okay, so as humans, we receive information and communicate with each other in a, in a highly unstructured way. Do we? In an unstructured way? Yeah, we do. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> most humans do, but I have been told that I always talk as if I'm uh, like a PowerPoint slide. I'm always on bullet points, A, B, C, and things like that, especially when I disagree with people. But I mean, in general, anything that we see, anything that we hear, or the language that we speak, they're all unstructured data. And uh, our brains have this core ability to quickly make sense of this kind of data, but to, to computer or to a machine, these are just meaningless. Uh, and the main component of these AI systems uh, is, which is, which is called artificial neural network, which tries to mimic how human brain functions. So our human brains, uh, consists of millions and billions of neurons with very complex interconnections. So what this artificial neural network does is they contain a lot of neurons which are, which are structured in a layered way. They take input, which are these unstructured data, text, images, audio, speech, anything. They do some operations on that, pass it to the next layer, and this thing happens until the whole network can make sense of the data. Right. So our brain itself is a network and through various neurons making those connections, we make sense. And that whole process is mimicked in a machine. Right. Wow. Maybe I talk in a structured way because my brain has fewer neurons than most other people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but Nagendra, Mira talked about all that data. Solmas talked about how a neural network progresses through a network and makes sense. For it to be useful, it has to happen fast can't take years for this to happen. So how is that possible? Right, Nalin. So Mira talked about billions of data points which are getting captured. So Almas talked about complex neural networks which, uh, which are trained. So to make sense of that big data using these kind of models, there are enormous number of calculations which need to happen very quickly, right? And that's where uh, the new kind of infrastructure is able to help us with. So they are able to do those kind of calculations very quickly. Uh, let's take an example of uh, Twitter. So every second, there are around 6,000 tweets which are getting generated. And let's say if you want to look at the trend of what's happening on Twitter, then you need very, very high processing power to make sense out of that, uh, those kind of tweets which are getting generated. So even a decade back, uh, it was 
unimaginable to process this kind of data at such a fast speed. Uh, but with the advancement which has happened on the chip technology, network architecture, we have the right kind of infrastructure to process this kind of data. So just in the last six, six, seven years, uh, the compute power has increased by almost 300,000 times. 300,000 times? Yeah. So, you know, people talk a lot about big data. They even talk about neural networks and artificial intelligence. But most people forget that none of this would be possible unless these technologies had developed to such an extent. Because what you just said, Nagendra, is that what we, let's say, six years ago could have done in 300,000 hours, we can now do in one hour. That's a huge change, right? So with all that change, with all this data and all these algorithms and all this technology, where have we started doing things differently from how we did them before? Uh, in your work, Mira, for example, how are you doing things differently now than before? So we know that all industries are being impacted by big data. One thing I've seen is in market research. So traditional methods of market research include things like focus groups and conducting surveys. So you would take a representative sample of the population, N, and you would ask them how they're behaving, what they're doing, right? So with big data, two key components have changed. The first is that sample size, N. We no longer need a representative sample of the population. We have the entire population. And the second key component that changed is that we no longer need to ask people what they're doing. We can see how they're behaving. And this is really significant because there's a big gap between what people say they want to do and what they actually do. Well, that is clear to me. I used to work in a consumer products company and we used to ask mothers, what do you feed your children? And they'd always say healthy things. Yeah. You know, fruits and cereals. But when you open their pantry doors, chocolates and chips would fall out. Exactly, yeah. And, and they, we do know that 95% of customer behavior is unconscious. So now what you're saying is that we can actually not only capture what a consumer is or a person is doing without having to wait for what he or she says, but we can do for everybody. Exactly. So that, I hope, uh, changes the life of a market researcher. You can't fool a market researcher sure. anymore. <laughs> well, I never wanted to fool a market researcher. That's not my goal. Any other examples in our lives of how uh, professionally things have changed? You know, then, uh, machine translation is a very good example where AI is very effective. So let's say if you have an essay or a book in English and you want to convert it into Spanish, machines are able to do that uh, with very, very high accuracy and very quickly. And to develop those kind of translation models, uh, what you need is you need millions of uh, lines in English and their corresponding sentences in Spanish. And this is what the algorithms will be able to make use of to create a good translation model. Right. So millions of sentences. I mean, just in the last five minutes, we may have said thousands of sentences. So millions and millions of sentences in one language, millions in another, and you can translate. Tell us, Solmas, how does that happen? Uh, it's actually a very complicated task because traditionally it was done by developing a statistical learning models using highly complicated and sophisticated linguistic knowledge. But nowadays with deep learning, you actually don't need to have those kind of linguistic knowledge. What the AI system does is takes one sentence in one language and then tries to find the best representation of that sentence in terms of numeric value. So it tries to encode that into numbers. Uh, and then the decoding process will happen. It will take that representation, that numeric value, and then we'll start decoding. We'll start finding the next best probable word that should come in the target language. So that's how this sequence-to-sequence -sequence model thing is able to do the translation for us. So I um, know now that in the medical community, if a doctor writes a diagnosis in Spain uh, and it's translated by a machine, in English in America, people accept that. The medical community accepts that as a valid translation. So these models have developed to that level with millions of sentences and the sequencing that you just described. Okay, so we have two great examples of how big data 
algorithms and high compute have improved our professional lives. But what about normal people like me in a day to day? We experience magic every day. Which is any one of your favorite example where these three have combined in a magical way? So one app that always impresses me is Shazam. I can't believe how it can find a, so a, a song that I want to know in a matter of seconds. And I know that Shazam has a database of millions and millions of songs. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because that is my favorite too. Mm -hmm. But probably in another way. Because, you know, I sit in these cool settings with cool people. They're listening to music. I don't know what it is. And then I slightly look it up in Shazam and then join the conversation. <laughs> written as if I, I do the same thing. Well, I didn't, I didn't realize you, you needed to do it, but I probably need to do it. So Shazam, millions of songs matched. Solmaz, how does that happen? Okay, so Shazam, uh, again, tries to find a good representation of the songs, which they call it audio fingerprints, using amplitude, frequency, and time of each sound. And then they also store that in a highly efficient and organized and very smart way. So these fingerprints, audio fingerprints, are actually numeric values. So when you query a song, that audio file is not actually what's being searched. That audio fingerprint, which are these numeric values, is used to do the comparison, to do the matching, and then it's able to quickly receive that song very efficiently and very accurately. But with due respect, Solmaz, Shazam is able to retrieve the song sooner than how you explain how it is done. <laughs> so how does that happen so fast, uh, Nagendra? Right, so as a uh... Mira talked about uh, Shazam having millions and millions of songs and yeah, you have to store those uh, in a smart manner uh, through fingerprints. But still on a daily basis, last I checked, uh, I think Shazam is getting around 20 million requests right, on a daily basis. And for each of these requests, within 2-3 seconds, Shazam is able to retrieve the right kind of song from that big library of theirs. And that is only possible through a large number of GPU servers that they deploy, first to create the fingerprint, as well as at the time of request, retrieving the right kind of song from one of those millions of songs. Right, right. That's interesting. So we talked about text and now we talked about audio fingerprints through amplitude, frequency and time. Any other favorite examples in daily lives how things have improved? Yeah, another application which I use a lot and I know that millennials also love that is, is searching by image. So when you want to buy something and you have it in mind, we used to just type it in words and then just type it in the search engine. But that can be cumbersome a lot, in so many times, right? But nowadays we can just upload any picture that you want from any product that you want or you can just instantly take a picture, take a photo and then upload that. The search engine will be able to process that and make sense of that and understand what is there in that image and it shows you similar items. Right. I'm a victim of a lot of expense as a result of this improvement. Because, you know, you can look for a nice little chair somewhere and then you take a picture and next thing you know, that chair is in your house. It makes shopping yeah? easy, yeah. yeah. And then another chair. And then the cushion and the uh, curtain behind it. So, well, that is very useful. Great application, but also expensive. <laughs> so, uh, these are really good examples of how our lives are changing. One of the most interesting things I read recently in a magazine was that through big data algorithms and high compute power, you can actually write full novels. So for example, the machine can read Hemingway and produce a novel written in the style of Hemingway, not just the words and things, but a style also and the patterns. And you would think it's a Hemingway novel, but it's actually not. So that I thought was real advancement. Yeah, I mean, I won't be surprised if uh, in the next few years, a machine will be able to create this kind of smart conversation by itself. Because right now, machines are creating art. They are creating new kind of music. So next is probably this kind of... Smart kind conversation. Of, yeah. Recreated by a machine. Well, so they'll be able to capture Mira's image, your image, Solmaz's image, and they would have figured out the way we talk, the patterns and just drop in a subject which we don't know anything, at least I don't know anything about, like maybe fashion. And uh, we will have a smart conversation on fashion, done by the machine, by watched by us. <laughs> that sounds interesting. But I do want to assure our viewers that this conversation 
is actually real. This is not an outcome of a machine. This is not an outcome of big data, great algorithms, and computing power. Uh, but it is about that. And I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you found that it made uh, a lot of sense to you. And uh, hopefully, you will join us for another smart conversation, which we will bring to you pretty soon. But in the meantime, I would like to thank Nagendra, Solmaz, and Meera for joining me for this conversation at the EXL Digital Studios. And once again, thank you for joining us. That was today's Smart Conversation. Thanks for joining us today, and we hope you have a great week. Smart Conversations is a co-production from Nan Maglani and our EXL communication team.